please so let me introduce the uh, speaker of the day uh, welcome srishti ulla seven she has a bachelor's in fishery science degree from college of fisheries ratnagiri mm -hmm. under bala sahib seven konkan krishi vidyapeet dapoli further she completed her masters in marine biology from james cook university townsville which is in australia currently she is working as a hatchery technician at clean sea seafood limited uh, her work mostly focuses on live feed for example rotifers as the first feed for larvae and then for the fingerlings growing in recirculatory aquaculture systems until they are ready to go to the sea cages for grow, grow out farming so today she is going to give an overview of the yellow tail kingfish uh, species Uh, which is Seriola lalandi and an insight into the clean seafood limited the company where she worked uh, which and the, the company is a global leader in full cycle breeding production and marketing of yellow tail kingfish she will describe the potential of ytk uh, uh, as a candidate aquaculture species and who are the big players in the business so uh, over to you sushti thanks very much Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, let me just start sharing the screen. Hello, everyone. My name is Trishti Savant, and currently I am working at Clean Seas Seafood Limited in Arno Bay, South Australia. And today I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview about the yellowtail kingfish aquaculture, its breeding production, and its a uh, bit of a market review. Um, as I'm working at a commercial hatchery, um, there are a few. Um, I, I cannot openly uh, talk about everything, but I will try my level best to give as much as knowledge as I possibly can. Uh, so starting with yellowtail. um about the species itself uh it's a beautiful big fast open water fast swimming uh fish it's grown to, um it's grown and it's native to the temperate uh water environment uh it is uh it has a nice firm whitish pinkish flesh and it is high in omega content as you can see the nom the common name yellowtail comes from its bright yellow color and that is its distinctive feature to find it anywhere under water and it's very easily located uh it is one of the fastest growing fish uh species and it can grow up to 2.5 kilograms within a whole year uh the male kingfish matures up to in in one year whereas the female takes uh quite longer up to say 4 years uh the species spawns generally around spring and summer periods the young fish uh stay generally off show uh which are about 50 40 to 50 centimeters in focal uh, in focal length um the age of uh the species is considered to be over 20 years so far uh, according to the research conducted so kingfish has been um provided all around the world with its high demand and it has different market sectors and uh one of the famous market sectors coming up with uh, in the form of fresh fillets which is um the one of the most common ones distributed around then you have them as cutlets where you have a nice flesh all around and a bone in the center uh then it's uh, also cut into pieces for fresh sashimi or in different um small packaged um, um forms of uh, kind of um pieces where you can have it like cooked or in a different variety of cooking as it's um and mostly it's famous for sashimi and surimi all around the world so why farm yellowtail of all the species why would you consider um farming yellowtail personally um i actually love the fish but uh, economically speaking why would you go for it so the most important thing is they are they thrive under high density environments they are a very hardy species and they are very very uh, resistant to stress which is uh, one of the key um, um attributes uh it has less larval aggression and cannibalism uh, as opposed to most of the species as we've heard baramundi tends to be a lot of cannibalistic in nature um but this species is surprisingly um low in that sector 
Uh, one of the an another um, important factor is the broodstock hormonal induction. We do not need to um, have any hormonal induction taking place. Uh, just based on photo period and temperature, we can uh, manipulate uh, the spawning conditions for our broodstock. Uh, it is found to be one of the really good species to grow in research systems. And a lot of research has been conducted in the field respectively. And uh, a lot, there seems to be a good potential future uh, to grow in a research uh, form. It has, it's fast growing as I mentioned before, and it has a high market price and it's acceptable uh, due to which there is a very nice return of investment uh, other than as compared to most other aquaculture's temperate spaces available. Um, and as I said, the RAS culture is getting um, more and more, um, people are getting more and more interested in having RAS culture, which also makes it very um, uh, desirable as the meat will be free of parasites. And that will be make an optimal choice uh, for having raw fish consumption because that is its main form uh, to be consumed um, globally. And as it has high price in sashimi, sushi, nigiri, a lot of Peruvian recipes as ceviche. And it has um, a lot of other options for growing, uh, for cooking in different ways. And it is an excellent product as a frozen product. Uh, it is an excellent performance as a whole frozen product. Um, it is high. Uh, um, the flesh has holds its firm, firmness, texture, taste. You can either grill it, bake it, um, there are a lot of recipes around where people are making dips out of kingfish. It's a small scale, but it still works pretty good. And you can smoke it. Um, there's like heaps of options that are available. Uh, it is highly demand, highly in demand globally. Uh, as you can see in the map, it has, a, it, in North America, seems to be like the highest demand so far. Um, so in Europe, Asia, and Australia too. Um, in Australia, if you go to say, uh, it's a native for south southern part of Australia. So people in the northern parts, or I'm not sure, Deepak, if people are into eating around in the northern regions, but here around the south, it's named, named to be a really big delicacy. Uh, considering the growth potential of the fish, um, it outset Japan, kingfish, um, the, the production of kingfish in general has increased quite a bit uh, over the recent years, as you can see, since 2013, so till 2021, it has been on a rise, um, uh, excluding 2020, which we can understand it was affected by COVID like every, like all the other markets as well. But um, other, other than that, you can, it has been a quite um, nice increase. Uh, kingfish is not a new species, like it's not, a new aquaculture species to be introduced. It's been around for ages, but it has not, it is not, you cannot compare it to uh, the global farmed other species, which are, for example, salmon. It's even less than 1% in terms of production with salmon. Like it's such a big industry where kingfish still needs to catch up. But um, hopefully there are better prospects in the future. Um, for Japan, Japan is considered to be the largest production um, of Cereola species in general. But out of the entire species for Cereola, uh, the Landi has 3,819 metric tons from Japan, um, according to the data uh, provided by the Ministry of Fisheries. And we have other producers like Australia, which has 3,000 metric tons, Europe for 1,000, Mexico is still uh, coping up with uh, less than 500 metric tons, and there are still other countries, but the data isn't uh, known so far. Scenario, uh, I would like to talk about different places which are interested and which are doing research or have been doing research in the past with uh, kingfish as a species. Um, starting with Indian Ocean Fresh Aquaculture, it was based in Western Australia. Uh, near the Geraldton coast uh, since 2016. It was uh, developing aquaculture processes. Um, so it was mostly, they had taken a lot of information um, from us, like they were kind of from clean seas. Um, they were kind of trying to replicate it um, in their coast. But unfortunately, uh, last year, uh, the owner decided to um, stop the commercial 
um, use of um, commercial production because of some laws that had been changed in Western Australia. So she did not find it feasible to continue with the process. So unfortunately that was cut down. She uh, eradicated her entire broodstock, which is unfortunate, but hopefully something um, else could be um, uh, beneficial for her in, that, in, in, the, in the terms of keeping it. Um, then again, in the late 2010s, YTK Farms was established again in Western Australia near the Abrolos Islands by Huan Aquaculture. Um, Huan Aquaculture um, Australia is a very big, very big company, especially for farmed salmon. Uh, but then now they've been trying to branch their ways out. They had, um, as far as I know, they were kind of having a research-based uh, approach, and they were hoping for. Um, um, getting into commercialized um, production, but I do not think they went through with it. Um, there's, there are some uh, culture um, attempts made in New, in New Zealand, in, cage, in sea cages, as well as in uh, land-based forms around the northern New Zealand. And Chile is also currently, uh, is the country that's currently testing in sea cages and land-based farming methods. And Chile is the country that provides spawning all throughout the year. Um, nobody else does for kingfish yeah, other than the country. I, I do not have a lot of knowledge about what um, in Germany, but this is so far I know that they've been cultivating and they're trying their first land-based um, sea fish culture farm with, clean, um, with kingfish. And um, as it is, Japan is growing them all in sea cages. Um, the demand for um, RAS is increasing exponentially, I won't use the word, but it's, it's kind of getting through it with Japan to uh, culture them in the RAS culture. Uh, the only thing about Japan is they do not get, they do not have any spawning means so far. They, whatever their juveniles are, they're all wild caught. Uh, that's uh, one of the reasons I think their species for Cereola lelandi is lesser than their other Cereola species because of the wild uh, catch, the production as compared to the species when you compare them in the country. Um, another big upcoming company called, which is the Dutch company called the Kingfish Company, it's planning to open up a land-based operation in Maine, USA, and it is um, going to be completely uh, land-based and it's it's going to have an entire big research system uh, with having a capacity of 8,500 tons, which is quite a lot. And um, they have another, um, they're still expanding their Netherlands, um, the um, uh, capacity in Netherlands in which they are hoping to reach another 3,500 tons by the end of this year. Um, their current uh, for, um, annual production for the in the facility that's available in Netherlands is 1500 tons, which is still pretty good um, to compare. Uh, coming to Clean Seas, uh, good place. Um, it is known to be one of the biggest producers for kingfish uh, after Japan. It was founded in 2000. It was actually initially a research and development company uh, to close the life cycle of uh, southern blue, uh, bluefin tuna, kingfish, mulloway, and snapper. And now it's just focused on the entirely uh, on the production of yellowtail kingfish. It is native to these waters, uh, the Spencer Gulf in South Australia. And um, we are supplying about 98% of Australian consumption and 35% uh, of European. This, these, uh, these figures are pretty much um, the clean seas um, anal uh, analytics. And uh, the company is listed in the ASX in Australia and it has a secondary listing in Norway, which was, um, I think it was listed like last year or the year before. It just so it's kind of recent in Norway. Uh, it, is a, it is a firm believer in sustainability. It's finding its principles, it's farming practices, supply chain, commercial positioning and including its R&D focus. Um, this is not just, um, there are a lot of companies that keep saying that uh, it's just sustainability, you know, I, you don't know if it's, um, if they're following through, but I've been working here for, for a couple of years and I feel that it's doing its best it can to meet the standards and I feel that um, personally, um, what I've seen with other companies or something, this company is doing pretty good in terms of 
value um, valuing the sustainability values and trying to um, not kind of damp the environment and all sorts. So now this is a basic um, vertical integrated supply chain, which is um, called ectoplate. So we are an entire, Clean Seas has an entire uh, life cycle, starting from um, breeding to the fingerlings, to the farming and um, the harvest processing, the branding, the distribution, all of it is under in-house. It's all under um, one company. Uh, which is pretty impressive. And uh, it's a beautiful chain of command as it goes from one to another. Coming to its sustainable production, um, it is reared in a perfect environment. Nothing is going to waste. We do not um, tend to hamper, we try our best to not hamper anything. We use the best uh, liquid nitrogen sensor, uh, sensory fresh freezing technology, uh, which is a minus degree 90 degrees freezing facility, which is capable of freezing 10 times faster than your regular uh, freezing. So for example, if um, your normal like, required freezing, if it takes say, about um, four hours, this with the sensory fresh technology, it can be achieved within 70 to 20 minutes, which is quite fast. And um, uh, we do have a lot of uh, new economic changes of um, uh, supply to new market segments and we are trying to reach out more and trying to supply more and further away um, the I mean we're trying <laughs> and then we have the ongoing investment in blue economy research including with a lot of kingfish diet development so we have a lot of benchmark trials that keep happening all around um, the time with a with a good R and D um, team, which is separate from the technicians that work here, so they are completely dedicated to find um, a new diet development and which is more feasible and which is more um, friendly and economic friendly and um, obviously also for the better health of uh, the fish. Uh, Clean Seas is um, in the Southern Hemisphere, is the first company in the Southern Hemisphere to get the Aquaculture Stewardship Council and Friend of the Sea certification. Um, we even um, had it this year, which we passed with flying colors. So kudos to us, I guess. Um, we do have a new collaboration with CH4 Australia uh, in order to produce the methane reducing uh, Asparagopsis seaweed in its um, as it's native to our waters, we will be uh, renting one of our sites to the company so they can have their um, culture of uh, the seaweed happening in our hatchery. Uh, so it's quite an interesting and exciting to have a collaboration with them and see how it works. Um, the basic idea is to produce the seaweed and then provide it with the diets of the cows to reduce um, methane production. Um, in the atmosphere. So with all sustainability for life cycle production and the sale, we are considered to be uh, popular among a lot of chefs, diners at the Michelin star restaurants who seek good premium products. The um, we, I think, yeah, last year or the year before, we've also provided uh, fresh fish to um, MasterChef Australia. Uh, a lot of a couple of times we've had the guest come in here and select their fish, cook it on fry and um, to get a good um, relationship uh, with them. And it was pretty interesting to see how they were so impressed by the work it's getting done here, getting all the way directly from here directly to their plate fresh. And so the marketing in that spectrum is kind of um, improving. Over time, there I have since 2016, the Australian Food Academy has been uh, rewarding clean seas with, a, with different awards um, for good sustainable practices, good premium quality of food, uh, of fish, sorry. Um, the clean seas company uh, has a hatchery. It has a grow out facility and it does have a processing facility of its own. Um, I'll be repeating maybe these things quite often because it just keeps coming up because one thing is linked to another. So uh, sorry about that. So um, we have a hatchery that consists of so roughly 406 hectares of coastal and estuarine environment. 
uh, we we grow the fingerly, fingerlings indoor and we filtered with seawater pumped directly from the ocean. Um, the fingerlings are transferred into the grow out sea pens uh, in the open sea once, um, which is um, kind of close to the hatchery. Um, they're either sent by helicopters if it's right opposite or if it's a little further away in Fitzgerald Bay or Port Lincoln, it's been um, taken by, excuse me, it's been uh, taken by trucks. Uh, the headquarter facility for um, the processing is at Royal Park, which is in um, Adelaide, which is not too far away, say about 500 kilometers uh, from the current location. Um, so it takes about six, seven hours by car uh, by to drive. Um, so we keep talking about it's everything is here. Like we have a processing close by, we have all our sea cages close by one after to the other, and as well as um, our hatchery just situated here. Other than the fact that the proximity of um, the everything to be near one another um, to um, how, um, to kind of save the transportation, the reason why they used Spencer Gulf as one of the places is because it's a native to these waters and it provides. Um, greater quality and improved sustainability growing around in these natural waters because um, what place is best other than their natural environment. Um, but we do not overstock them. They are stocked at a decent um, uh, low stocking density. Uh, the best part about Spencer Gulf around here at Air Peninsula is that it's a dry environment. So there's like, it's like low rainfall. So we have, we have the absence of rivers. We don't have rivers around the region. So hence there is a less amount, there is, low amounts of organic matter, herbicides, pesticides, and other pollutants from which can get, get washed out by land farming flowing in through it. So, and um, so that is one of the, so we do not get any kind of runoffs into our cages. Also, we have uh, water coming in through uh, the Southern part from the Antarctica. Uh, so around with those chilly, um, fresh water come goes back and forth. So there's like a decent amount of water exchange that happens for them, which is another um, good um, environment for them to grow in. Uh, the seasonal water temperature ranges in the summer, it's around 22 degrees. It can go around to 26 as well. Um, and in the winter, it's about 13. Also, it does go below 13 as well. Sometimes it goes 12, it gets really cold. And, um, but these two combinations provide a really good combination for growth and the quality. And according to the economic of the scale, the operation, everything is a leverage when it comes to when it's under one single geography. Um, and the Adelaide in South Australia is the head office, which is easy for transportation. So within 24 hours, we have everything packed and ready to go. So this is um, the hatchery site, and I am trying. I'm gonna just try with the with the with the cursor if you can if you can see um, these. Um, the thing that looks like um, um, deeper. Can you see my cursor or? Um, yeah, yeah, we can see. Yeah, um, so it's it's a it's a really weird line but these two are actually just cages which are right opposite to a hatchery which are at a close proximity and um but we don't have cages at the moment but this is a picture i took um about 6 7 months ago and so i'm just going to give you a rough idea about how we get the water in and how it's supplied to the hatchery so around here we have our sea pumps where it's get and the water, the line of the sea pump extends way into the the sea and it gets sucked into the sea pump with its um, big massive pumps and then it's all collected in this uh, dam right here and it's a continuous supply of water so it's not like we fill it up and then we stop you know sucking water in it's a continuous fl flow of water because we do um, go through the water uh, quite a lot so the water is, is all collected here and then it's supplied through all throughout the hatchery. Uh, we directly take it from the sea so the, it's matched. So they are properly grown in the same salinity and 
uh, the temperatures can be manipulated. So we use heat exchangers or heaters and different various forms to uh, keep up the heat um, into this, um, depending on the need. Um, once it comes from the dam, from the dam, it sucks with the pumps and it goes through the, the sand filters, then it goes through the sock filters, then it goes through the UVs. That's your main um, big um, uh, function. Plus, again, you have every department, the brood stock, live feed, larval department, the individual and the, the nursery department, they all have their individual sock filters and UV filters. So the water is filtered again and then it's provided to um, the rest of the hatchery. Um, this is our incubation room. We have uh, four incubation tanks, which we normally use for spawning. And um, we have um, generally about four runs. So we do have four spawning periods um, around the entire year. And um, it comes, um, so this is the egg morphology. Uh, so we have a brood stock. I don't have a lot of pictures of brood stock in here. So, but I would like to um, talk about it because we do not, as I mentioned before, use any hormones induced for uh, a brood stock, but we only manipulate them through photo periods and, um, um, and temperature. So the warmer temperature that they need um, for spawning and then the eggs have been collected after whenever we have the spawning periods we tend to rise up their temperatures and when we just want them as we're just holding the brood stock we lower them the temperatures and keep it as an ambient temperature water so whatever the water is sucked in it's just um, flowing through there's no heat um, temperature manipulations but once we plan on spawning them so we change our photo periods, we change uh, our temperatures accordingly, and then the entire spawning table um, takes place. Once they are spawned, they are, the eggs are collected, and then they have been stored into each of these um, uh, spawning tanks. And then they have been, once they um, hatch, and once they hatch, they've been transferred into the larval, the larval tanks. So the egg morphology, um, uh, just an overview saying that they are spherical, they are buoyant, transparent, and they have an oil globule in the yolk. They hatch up to 67 to 70, uh, in 67, to, sorry, 75 hours after fertilization. Now this is dependable um, uh, with temperature. If, if you have warmer temperature, um, they will hatch sooner, but they will hatch a little less according to, um, sorry, <laughs> um, according to, um, I just saw the message, I'll get back to you once um, this comes through. Um, uh, they hatch, so this is roughly, say about anything between 20 to 21 degrees Celsius. Um, but if you go a little warmer, then there is a chance that you can get a faster, um, hatching, um, um, right, like, you know, the time. Um, the most importantly, the yolk that has, that's been formed, it gets absorbed in three days after they hatch. The egg diameter is roughly uh, 1.8. Um, this is like um, an average, uh, like a, a not set in stone. This is basically a normal, one of the researchers that happened has these kind of values. We do not um, check it every time we do it. It's a commercial place. We don't keep looking at it, but we do follow this chart. Um, it's it taken from one of the scientific papers and uh, we have this chart with us and we always see what we have, you know, what we have collected and at what stage uh, our eggs are at. Like most of the time, they are between the 32 cell stage till um, the blastula stage. Mostly when we get those eggs, cause if they spawn overnight, we'll be collecting them in the morning or mostly afternoon. And if they've been, um, so depending on what time we collect the eggs is the stage we find out, but it's sometime between the G stage, that is the 32 cell stage and the blastula stage. Most of the time we 
um, get these two stages uh, more often than the usual. So uh, this is a chart that we follow through. Then, then coming up with larval rearing. Um, another thing about um, the eggs is we do have um, really good experts in um, looking at their vitality and depending on how, um, if the eggs are good, if they are stocked good with the quality and they have like a proper sheet, a proper mechanism to see if they are worth stocking and um, they have their own techniques and quirks where they find out if it's, um, you know, um, a good to move forward. Sometimes we do not get a big spawn. We get a very small spawn as opposed to hundreds of thousands or a, there, there are times when you can get a million, but then there are times when you can just get a few hundreds. And that is the time we feel that our brood stock is not as efficient working at the moment. So we tend to discard it because we know we are not going to get a proper growth out of them, or we are not going to get um, good um, growth like their weight, or we could have a lot of deformities in the future. And because of that, we tend to just cut them off. Uh, a lot of their obviously egg development depends on our brood stock of how we keep take care of them. We tend to spend a lot of time nurturing them because they are, are obviously our initial uh, part. So their, their feed is at most important, which has been coated with oils and vitamins and uh, all of that. There's a proper calculation and a proper feed chart that goes through them. Uh, and we have different feed companies that uh, a mixture of different feed pellet, pellet feeds to get the best results from them. Um, this is just um, as an enrichment purposes, like how we enrich our live feeds, we do enrich our broodstock feed as well. Uh, one of the main key importance is the taurine. Uh, it has been proven that without taurine, the fish do not have um, a good uh, lifespan. Uh, even if you think that um, the deficiency of taurine in their diet can lead to uh, deformities in the larval stage or even in the fingerling stage, but also once they grow up, even when they are big and adults, you can find deformities caused because of lack of um, taurine in their diet. So that is one of the most important components, one of the most important amino acid uh, requirement um, for kingfish. Coming to um, our larval reading, this is, uh, I know it looks really weird, but um, this is one of um, uh, a picture that our technician had taken. Uh, it's about uh, six, six, 16 oh, day or something like that. Um, I do not know. I just like the picture. So I just thought of putting it up. And uh, so this is our morphological development of the fish from day one, DPH, uh, day post hatch, to the day 20. Um, it's used in the 30 magnification, and this is not being published anywhere. This is um, solely um, uh, made by my senior. He decided to, so he like started from one day till the 20th, he started making these morphological changes, and you can see how it's kind of beautifully grown in its way till day 20. It's kind of cool, um, but it's not published anywhere or anything. It's his own stuff, but he just lended me so that I could show you all that this is pretty much the development that goes through. There are a few scientific papers where you have the proper, where they have the morphological development according to like scientific research, but this is just something playing around in the hatchery um, in time. Right, um, this swim bladder inflation, one of the most important things to consider when we are taking, um, when we are talking about larval um, quality, like when we are culturing the larvae, the larvae I think are in the larval, we keep them for about three to four weeks once they hatch. Um, and swim bladder inflation is mostly, see, a, a lot of research papers say that they've been seen between three to five days, but in the hatch day, we generally consider them at day five onwards. And if you can see those two images very clearly, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you can, if you all can spot it, but I've drawn a few small circles around. 
um, a few larvae here that shows there is like a small bubble, whereas around in these, you can see it's absent. So that's what we are looking for. This is the magic bubble, as we call it in our hatchery. This, when we say that, everyone's happy because we know they are good quality. And um, one of the main key components of having um, the magic bubble is uh, affected by the light source. So the photo period, the light uh, manipulation is very important um, in larvae at a very um, st stage for um, having their, um, for the development of swim bladder. And also it helps with their, that's what the whole purpose is for the buoyancy control. It obviously has the energy expenditure, it, can, um, it influences it, um, the migration, the predator av avoidance um, in the tanks, it is, um, so there are a lot of factors that influence um, swim bladder um, inflation. Also, there is a lot of high mortality rates in the larvae, um, which fail to inflate their swim bladder, and they consequently are unable to control their buoyancy and their vertical positioning within the tank. So you need to have like this vertical positioning because they need to come up on the surface of the water to kind of gasp um, a few, uh, a bit of air. So for which um, they need to have that vertical um, alignment, which cannot be achieved if the swim bladder is not inflated pro properly at that age. Uh, something to influence them is also skimmers in larval tanks. You need a lot of skimmers to get all the um, oils uh, on the surface oils so that the larvae can gain access to the surface. Uh, so one of our main concerns when we are looking into um, the larvae um, as they are growing is looking into the swim bladder inflation as it um, has a lot of influence on their growth. And the ones that do not have swim bladder uh, properly developed tend to have higher density. Their weight tends to be high. They're, they're denser as they grow in age, which is as they're a pelagic fish, it's not ideal for them. Um, so it's a very important uh, component to consider in, in terms of larval rearing. Then comes the life feeds. Um, the very first feeds that we go for is rotifer for feeding. Their very first um, feed on day three, um, they, are, they tend to open their eyes a bit like more like saying that they are not developed. So by the day three, they start developing and then they can see. Our larval tanks are filled with nanochloropsis algae. So um, they're always floating in them. And then we um, provide them with enriched rotifers. Um, and we, we um, I'm sorry, we just have an alarm in the system. So I just got startled, sorry about that. Uh, we have a pulse feeding approach where rotifers are heavily. So it just means that we put, a certain amount in the tank and then until they are fully depleted we'll replace them in a shorter period of time and now with all so being practiced for so many years they know at what time the best feeding rates are after a certain few hours our technician will check how much rotifers or artemia for that matter are left in the tank and according to that estimate they will decide how much more to feed in their next feeding so in case if there's for example, 18 rows per mil in the first feeding, they might drop it. And if they see there is some residue or they can see some rotifers still flowing, um, swimming around, they will reduce the next feed to five um, rotifers per mil. So that's been calculated by the person working in the department. And um, the picture that you're saying, it's, it's actually Artemia. It's been fed to the tanks. Once you just put them there, they rush like, <laughs> It's crazy. It's actually a beautiful sight to see. Unfortunately, I don't have a video with me to show you all, but um, hopefully next time I can um, um, circulate the video to see. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, after order for feeding, we have our Artemia feeding. It's weaned into it like after a week or so. Um, after the first feeding, and then you go into Artemia, the most um, mortalities, the highest mortality rates that have been witnessed is between rotifer feeding and artemia feeding. Between this weaning period, we, we found that there are higher rates of mortality. Most of them have been considered to be because of um, lack of buoyancy, so swim, flat, um, swim bladder inflation. So that 
is the most um, mortality rates that we've witnessed. So, and we have been connecting it to um, their buoyancy control. The other thing is after Artemia, after a week, we again wean them to our pellet feed, starting with 200 to about 400 micron pellet feed, which is, I suppose, um, a, 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 the generic kind that uh, goes into it. I had been working, I was working in Rodifers for about a year when I started working here. It's quite intense. We have a flow through system. If I can give you a little bit of an introduction about it, it's a flow through system. We use uh, Branchionis uh, plicatilis. Um, I, hope, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, it's the L-shaped uh, rotifer and uh, they have their own really good breed um, program here. Like it's beautifully cultured in here with um, proper uh, biosecurity measures taken and they have their own kind of variety, if you can say. Um, as opposed to what you find in other places because they have been culturing them in their own, in this one specific hatchery for so many years that um, they have, they do not supply mostly outside to anybody, but in case if anybody asks, they um, sell them to another company or so. But they are very sturdy rotifers. They are very, um, uh, they, we culture them all year around and they've been, they're good quality and obviously, uh, when we feed the larvae, we just don't feed them uh, the plain rotifers and artemia. We do feed them the enriched ones. They are enriched with um, espresso uh, for um, uh, El Selco for um, both rotifers and artemia. As we know that kingfish obviously eats their own marine. Um, they have their own life prey when they are out in the natural open waters. And when they come here and when we have to rear them, we have to kind of make the best possible effort to give them the best nutrition uh, provided as they would get in their natural environment. So we have to enrich them because they're not exactly with the best um, um, nutritional value on their own. So we enrich them with these um, uh, components. And um, they have been um, seen that if we do not provide them, we have seen uh, skeletal malformations and uh, a lot of deformities around along the way. Also, taurine is another. Uh, so taurine is again being introduced with the rotifers when we are enriching on, with the espresso. We do enrich them with uh, taurine as well, mix it up in their diet from an early age so uh, they can get the best of uh, the nutrition from it. Going into nursery rearing. So once um, they are there for about three weeks. We send them to our nursery, which is around in the same side. It's a flow through system and they will uh, stay in the nursery for uh, say about until they come up to um, a size of uh, say three to five grams. So once they're three to five grams, um, that's the one at the top. Um, we, after once they reach that, we grade them every other day or every day, depending on how a grade size is and depending on how they're growing, um, the decisions are being made to grade. And um, once they are, once they reach up to this size, we have a wacky grader, which we grade through them. And then we just send them to a, what we call is a top site, which is our gas facility. It has a capacity of about a, a thousand cubes of water and it can produce up to 400,000 fish per run. So we have one to three systems out of which one system is 500, the other two are 250 and 250. Each tank, we have um, one, four tanks in the first system, which provide up to 50,000 fish per tank, which is quite a decent amount of density uh, to push through. So, and about when they are 75 days old, they are anywhere between 30 to 50 grams um, in, in weight. And then we send them from, um, our hatchery, uh, the RAS culture hatchery to the sea cages. One thing about um, the RAS system is it's one of the most sophisticated systems I've ever seen. I love working in there. Um, I've just recently started working there. So I'm kind of getting the hand and the grip of the things out in out and about. Um, the one it's the, the system is um, pretty much like a generic, um, Desuck system. So you have your mechanical filters, you have your biofilters. So we have a drum filter, and then it goes through 
the bio um, bio pump it goes through the UVs, then it goes through a biofilter. From your biofilter, it goes through your microparticulate. From the microparticulate filter, it goes into your degasser, and then the degasser provides um, water to um, the tanks. Uh, out of the three systems, we have introduced ozone uh, foam fractionator into one of the systems, and we've started using it this year, and we are seeing how much difference and how it can, it's influencing our water quality as water quality is one of the most important aspects to maintain in RAS because with fecal matter and organic, it can crash so quickly. Uh, and we have to be so vigilant to maintain every aspect of it. With ammonia, nitrite, nitrates, we do a lot of flushes. We have a big, we have a timetable where we do two micro flushes every um every week and maybe one or two bio flushes um weekly so we are making sure that we have a decent turnover of water it's been cleaned properly it's been bubbled so that we are providing the best possible clear water to the fish as possible and as the fish grow bigger uh, the microbial load the, the load starts to you know increase so this is one of the reasons we can actually keep them 30 grams to 50 grams is mostly 30 grams i think 30, 35 grams with having 50,000 fish in each tank is like, oh yes, we are pushing the capacity. We don't want to go beyond that because um, we do not feel um, it's too much load on the systems and it won't keep up, it, it will crash. And if we have to wait till 50 grams, we do not stock them as high as 50,000. We will stock them half the size if we want to grow them to 50 um, grams. Also, depending on your temperature, we also manipulate different temperatures depending on when we need to uh, send our fish from the nursery to the sea cages. So it, at 75 years old, they are up to 50 or 60 grams, but even quicker, we can get them to a bigger size um, depending on the temperature. The higher the temperature, the more they eat. Once you start dropping the temperature, they tend to slow down. Their activity tends to slow down, but and we don't have to feed them as much. So that's one way we control uh, their growth in the hatchery. The grow out sector, um, we send uh, at 30 to 50 grams from the sea, uh, sorry, from the nursery to the, to the cages. They either go from a helicopter, uh, they go in bins. So the helicopter just comes here, drops the bin, we fill them up with fish, it takes it up and it just drops it down into the cage directly. Um, that is only possible if the grow out facility is right opposite to our, it's, it's, if it's at the same site as Arno Bay, which is the hatchery is available. We other have two other hatchery spots, uh, sorry, um, uh, cages, which is one is in Port Lincoln and the other one is Fitzgerald Bay, which is in Viola. Once, if we have to send it out to those places, we have to have them in um, in trucks where the trucks can hold up to 25,000 or 26,000 fish at a time, one truck. So we send them in batches um, when we have to send them by truck um, in those three trucks at a time. And um, so the grow out has their own, uh, their own working mechanism. We do not, uh, we do not um, uh, get there unless they are like short staff and we have to go help them out. But um, the basic idea of the grow out is with, we, we send it to them and, they, and it belongs to them. Like they, and now it's their property, but um, they grow it for two years and they grow it up to four to four and a half kilos. And then they're transported to the processing uh, facility that's in Adelaide. They have, obviously they go, they start from a smaller mesh. That's how we depend if we want to send them at 30 grams or we have to send them at 50 or whatever demanded, depending on what kind of mesh they have available, we have to grow the fish accordingly. Otherwise there's a very easy chance of the fish to escape through the nets and which we do not want the catastrophe to happen. So we have to depend on that size. They have to change the mesh as they keep growing because you need to have a amount of water flow depending on how big they're getting. And so they change their mesh three times in their life while they are in those cages. And as bigger they get, the pellet size keeps increasing and they have their own stock and they have their own um, um, kind of um, a way that they operate into things. They do have cameras uh, so, um, situated on a surface and underwater to monitor their feeding uh, of how they are feeding because it's they have an automatic feeder. So it's just like you have to go and just have to make sure that the feed is um, thrushing out into the water. 
amazing part about them is the ones that um, they grow amazing in summer. In the warmer periods, they are like um, really, um, they grow a lot with the warmer waters. They eat a lot. And then that's when they grow to the size that you want them. In the winter, their growth is very slow. So they do not eat as much. They'll just kind of um, use their energy to just preserve, like kind of um, keep their body temperature uh, upright, like they'll sustain. Uh, but it's not a bad thing. Uh, it just means that in the winter season, they won't grow, but they will maintain the meat quality and they will sustain um, accordingly. And, um, oh, sorry. I think I just went too further away. Uh, oh, right. Uh, a few problems that happen in grow out is um, the health problems that we face because it's natural waters. We cannot control a lot of parameters out there. So fluke, this is the picture is of a skin fluke. Um, I took this picture is actually in a, in a museum. So technically it's um, not a real fish, but this is exactly how it looks. Um, I, I think there are a few pictures, but I didn't have it on hand. So this is just to give you an idea that this is how the skin fluke looks like. Um, uh, it's kind of like a flat worm. They also have uh, gill flukes where they are kind of like a string and they hook to the gills and they get attached to them. And they just kind of, um, they just kind of have, you know, reduced appetite. They start like getting slower in growth. They have a lot of extreme cases do cause death um, and a loss of osmotic control and uh, all of uh, those basically a discomfort to the fish and they can really hamper them so we have to control and the only treatments available in here is to hydroxide uh, hydrogen peroxide baths or prazipontal baths and they need to be monitored and been prescribed by the vet in Australia it's use you can use these but there has been cases where if you're not using them in proper quantities it can lead to um, uh, fate it can be fatal um, so water quality is again another concern. Um, according to the farm, there was an incident that happened in 2011. I am honestly not exactly sure what happened, but I am willing to I'll look into it and then I can, if anyone's interested, I can definitely let them know. Um, the other big um, problem that the grow out faces is the seals. They are very notorious. They come through and then they try to, uh, you know, take bites off the fish. And they just like sometimes just play around. And then most of the time they're obviously looking for food and they just tend to come and just eat half of it and then leave them to suffer or they kind of irritate them. So that's one of the other measures that need to be taken to kind of keep them away. So grow out has um, one of the most important things that they have to do is predator control. Um, they, they're feeding, um, they have to vigorously keep feeding and feeding through a proper arrangement, fish husbandry and bathing and net management. We have a big facility right into a hatchery where you, you can clean the nets, which is pretty massive and they're pretty huge nets, but they uh, we have those automated cleaners and it's all uh, done on site. Uh, fish husbandry and bathing, we have a health team and a research and development team. A health team is always specifically are uh, dedicated to grow out and they also come to hatchery to um, do health checks um, on a on a day um, not on a daily basis in the hatchery but in the grow out they do have to go on a daily basis and check for their uh, growth and and how good um, uh, their growth is or if there's anything problem if they need any anything so our health team is completely dedicated to our root stock. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, excuse me. Next comes to a processing. So after four, four and a half kilos, once they get to the size after two years, um, they are sent into a processing fast facility, which is uh, situated in Royal Park in uh, Adelaide. So um, I think they are just directly uh, gone. Um, they, they are transported by um, the boats once they are culled and, and then they have been unloaded at the, at the dock out there in Adelaide. So it, um, it carries out the sense of fresh technology. It's the liquid nitrogen rapid freezing technology to lock in the freshness, the flavor, 
uh, Spencer Gulf Hiram Asa Kingfish, which is another uh, term considered for clean says, like a synonym. It's a new, it's like a branding. Uh, and it's been frozen at around 24 hours after you harvest. So it's kind of quick. It's a rapid freezing and it is, um, it is because it's liquid nitrogen, it's, they use minus 95 degrees and um, it's stored at about four, minus 40 degrees Celsius in the state of the art facility. Um, I think it, um, it looks, sorry, it looks pretty much, it looks like this. We've, these are our big processing um, kind of fridges that they are stored at. And um, it's beautifully how they capture the texture, color, aroma, taste. It's, it's impeccable because we do, uh, the company does sometimes give us the fish for Christmas or um, some festivals or uh, we are offered and we have eaten those fishes and I have used all possible spices I can find here and it tastes magically amazing, which is good. And recently Clean Seas has started um, going into shops like a, re a proper retail shop, which, um, it's called Woolworths. It's kind of like a, like um, it's like a like a chain, like a market, like a supermarket. So it's like a it's a supermarket chain, and there are about eight hundred Woolworths sto group stores all um, all around Australia where they've started. They've started with two flavors, like one is just plain and one is lemon and dill. I haven't tried these products, so I have no idea. I have no comment on them, but it's a good marketing tactic. They came up with this once they started to feel the pressure of COVID because uh, Clean Sea's main um, export depends on um, the commercial, um, the passenger flights. So that's where they used to send their food uh, fresh from. And because in COVID there were not any passenger flights flying through, there was a big dent in their market. And we had heaps and tons of fish in the cages, which was kind of a a, a, a kind of a lashback for clean seas, but so then they came up with, um, they wanted to have their own processing facility to um, get into um, retail, but unfortunately it needed another millions of dollars of funding. So I think they teamed up with Just Caught, the frozen seafood. So we provide them and then they package it for us and then they sell it. And then it goes um, through Woolworths group stores in Australia. Uh, and there are two ways that we package in our system. The first picture that you see is it is stored, the whole fish is stored in styrofoam boxes and it's been transported within 24 hours. Like it's just gone in 24 hours, wherever it needs to reach. So because they are like nice and fresh, those fishes are the ones that go to different restaurants for sashimi. And uh, in Europe, Europe is one of the higher demand markets that we have uh, where we supply um this um the whole fish too and also um we have been trying a lot the company has been trying a lot to get a lot of more deals in um in america hopefully that comes up um uh, soon and this is a basic uh, a bit of a financial uh, overview of the company um i'm not exactly a, a, an economics person but this is like the most simplest language um i think that could come across. Um, it's about chains and market diversifications. Um, and there was a strong demand after um, King Fe um, after COVID and we had a very good year. So we had a drop in 2020, but then it was a nice spike into in financial year 2022. Um, the product uh, price has also, um, uh, increased, which was, um, I think, 17, 19 per kilo pre-pandemic. Now it's like 19 or three per kilo. So that made a big difference um, in the company. And uh, it says that the cash and unwithdrawn facilities of 40 million Australian dollars gives a balance sheet strength to deliver the growth and efficiency of the goals. So, so far has, it's been a good year for clean seas and hopefully it um, keeps going in. And this is from me. Um, any questions? Uh, thanks, uh, Sashti. Uh, really good talk. Um, I will uh, make myself visible. <laughs> <All right. laughs> oh, I, I can yeah. just um, yeah. need to stop sharing.
Yes. Yeah. So, so really good. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks for all who joined today for the talk. Um, so, before we go to discussion, let me show you. I have put the feedback link in the chat box. So, please take one minute for uh, to just give a feedback to Sushti. Uh, and really good job. And uh, first of all, I want to uh, you know uh, say a thank you to the Clean Seas Company to allow Sushti to provide this presentation and also and also acknowledging that you know uh, I, I i could read from Sushti that you know she she knows more but there's restriction she can't tell everything <laughs> she tried to explain yeah. as much as possible and so uh, if when you ask questions you know uh, so that's that's one thing you know she she will try to put everything as much as possible but uh, there, there are some reservation that you have to keep um so uh just to start with you know i have just a couple of questions and um yes yes I, uh, we we don't get here in nd but uh, yes in woolworth i have tried this once once i noticed you in linkedin and knew more about the company and you know i, I wanted to taste the fish and so i yeah. <laughs> from woolworth and it was really uh, really good tasting fish <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> unfortunately i really want to you know get a fresh fresh one but you know the one we yes yes the, absolutely yeah, yeah. um so uh, the the market in in japan so what are the other species of sariola that you mentioned you didn't mention but you know I was... yeah there are a few um i had them listed but then i forgot to put them in oh, but yes. um there is um a I do have it written somewhere because I was trying to like look for it and I'm I'm like where is it gone? Um, but I'm just looking. There at, is a. It's like a, a a lot of varieties, or is it just one or two species? You know. No, there are a few. Uh, there's one big. Um, there's one something from Q. Um. That is um that that actually controls a big market for them. um but i i'm so sorry i do not know the name the scientific name by heart um what it is but it is an amberjack um oh uh, yes i think someone men- um has written in the okay. in the yes, in I the did. chat section yeah mm-hmm. um i cannot i cannot pronounce it i'm sorry I can. but um so you're like queen curator yes that is the one that is a uh, really um in demand um it's uh, i think um that's why because they they have it as a wild caught for cereola landi they do not have the production like the species but ho- maybe they might catch up to it because there is a lot of feed that they have the best quality feed for kingfish um which we intend to import from them from japan but because we cannot completely rely on that feed is because like things happen like covid and then they were not able to send us feed and we had to kind of um you know exist with what we have in australia or where we can get it from like ridley or scretting or in not scretting but mostly ridley um we had to make do uh, with them but, and then we had to conserve our stock from uh, from japan so that we use them when we needed the most and when we could utilize it best when during our spawning and um periods and stuff so um there's a i have a, i still i think this was this was an opportunity for me from this talk to actually do some research on what the market is like for because we only hear that oh yes japan is big and you know but we never really looked into it honestly it was this time when i'm telling my workmates as well do you know this about our own yeah. kingfish that we are growing so it was it was a good experience in that sense too mm. yes you, uh, you briefly mentioned the nanochloropsis algae that you feed them uh, are you using a paste yes. are you growing them or are you using a paste no we we use the the generic paste that you get um yeah. in in the store and we just there is a certain concentration and um used and it's more like dripping in the tanks constantly um at a at a fixed rate and it keeps reducing as the fish as the larvae keeps growing so every day it will 
not every day, but every other day it will reduce. And by the time um, they are, their eyes are well developed, we stop it completely. It's um, considered to be um, according, it's said that it's because of the green light when we put the enriched Artemia or rotifers, it says that they have a good vision and they can see the feed better or by having that green color. So their orange color is much more evident for them. That's one of the reasons we also have um, uh, the green algae in, in the system for them. Uh, but we don't grow them, we just order them in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a long question here by Dipesh and he, unfortunately he left. So I Ooh. will re read, read out that question and you can answer that and after that i will open this for everyone else who can unmute yes. and talk. yeah so this sure. is cereola lalandi reaches 2.5 kilogram in one year and it, it is really a fast growing species for aquaculture i wanted to know the feed types and frequency including protein and lipid contents in the feed used for different life stages secondly i wonder whether commercial sea cage culture of species can be really non-polluting to the environment. What would be the depth of the sea uh, where cages are installed? Any bottom sediment analysis have been done to check the position of nitrogen and phosphorus from fish feeds and fecal matter? So that's the question. Right. Yes. So I unfortunately cannot uh, tell you about the entire feed types and frequency and like the exact uh, make of the feed. Uh, we do, um, it's, I, um, we are not, uh, in, you know, because it's specifically made for our fish and it is custom made from Ridley or from Odohimi or whichever band. Recently we've started with Bioma. So they send us their own yeah, mixture depending on what we want in the feed. So it's kind of custom made, which is, um, kind of not something to share, unfortunately, sorry about that. Um, but uh, I can, um, there are a few papers, um, I won't say papers, they're more like research based when companies have done some research with clean seas as a whole and they have different um, results that they've come through uh, in this terms if um, he would like to have a read or, um, but that's more like just a research based thing uh, to grow in that sense so i i don't know about but i unfortunately cannot discuss what we do in the company um the other thing about commercial sea cages is we about non-polluting the environment there would be an effect but there is such a big of amount of water exchange that happens in these areas that uh the deposition of the sediments as he's mentioned or nitrogen or phosphorus from the fish feeds and fecal matter um, we do have the, it's called the Cleave. Uh, Cleave is one of the districts that we stay in. And we have to um, provide them with samples. Like they themselves come along and collect samples from uh, different locations, including the hatchery, not just the cages, because um, we also have to keep in mind that we do not, you know, cannot uh, pollute the environment around us because um, in town. So they do come and they take samples according to where they want to take. So it's not like we are giving them according to our need. So they come and then they check and Friend of the Sea always has an Aquaculture Stewardship Council also have their yearly um, tests that they do and they come and see uh, for us and so there is obviously uh, some um, uh, pollution kind of happening, but it's not it's not hampering as much as damaging it because there is of the currents and water flow and the water exchange. And also we do not use the same site all the time. So we always move our sites. So for example, we had um, a few cages, um, the picture that I had when, when you could see two cages, um, when they were in Arno, but then the next uh, summer or the next winter, they were moved from that region to another site. So just so that we are trying to kind of have a uh, process, like a flow through where we don't have a fish out there, and then we change our sites. So we do have site changes from Port Lincoln, from Arno and Fitzgerald Bay. So that's one of our ways of trying to uh, compensate 
for the pollution or um, kind of the environmental effects that that we can cause potentially i don't know if that answers a lot but oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so so essentially there'll be some empty cages always at some sites yes there will be yes over oh, there are <laughs> there are um and also about i think there was one question about uh, the depth of the sea where the cages are installed i'm not sure of that answer but i can definitely talk to um someone in the grow out and um let you know with it um we don't have the staff around at the moment but um i can message someone and i'll all i can ask my manager and try to get that information of the depth yeah um yeah so i just want to um can you uh, put your email address if anyone want to oh, yes absolutely no yeah problem. just put in the chat box and so people can contact you in case the other question is about the mesh sizes of the three different production net cages so is Raju is asking what are the mesh sizes are you probably not very sure as you are not working in the grow out oh no i'm unfortunately i'm not really sure of the mesh sizes um of grow out operations i'm really sorry about that but um again i can always ask and um reply back but um yes i'm not aware of the three sizes there's only one thing that comes through is um i don't know if this makes sense but we have um they always get those meshes in a hatchery before we move our fish and they'll take every fish and like try to kind of put the fish through the net so anything uh, just to make sure that they don't escape but that's far that's as far as my um connection has been through the mesh but other than that i have i don't i do not know but i will definitely find out uh, about the mesh sizes and i'll get back to you so yeah okay. it can go through so i think next question here is by naresh and i think he's online do you want to speak out naresh so he's talking about why do we enrich espresso to rotifers before we feed to fish larvae and what algae you are using for rearing rotifers as live feed so uh, naresh if you want to come in and speak that will be better i think um i can actually answer i'll, I'll answer until the question yeah. um so for enriching espresso to rotifers so what happens is when fish are in the open sea when they have their own environment their natural environment they can feed on different life feeds like copepods or various other that's available in the natural environment and they get that amount of nutrition from those life feeds that that are available in the natural waters unfortunately there are only limited amount of life feeds we we can provide under cultured um culture circumstances so which is rotifers and artemia which are widely known for marine species they are not enough by themselves so we can just giving them rotifers on their own without enriching them with espresso will not give them the nutritional requirement that they need um with in terms of lipids amino acids all sorts of um nutrition that they require will not be provided and hence we need to enrich uh the rotifers and artemia to before we feed the larvae and there have been obviously experiments if we do not enrich them we have seen a lot of malformations skeletal malformations in um uh, in the fish there's a lot of because they do not have the enrichment when you're you're handling them as well you can see while doing weight checks for example you when you handle the fish they have um jaw deformities or skull deformities because they are so weak that they could not the rotifers themselves on their own um could not um uh, provide um them it's like protein shake for them you know like for just give them a little bit more of a push to provide the nutritional requirement that's why we enrich them uh the algae that we use for rearing rotifers as live feed is um we have it's called it's more like the dry algae i think um it's from uh, inway it's the sparkle it's called sparkle from the company inway um i can actually um just 
um, share it. And that is something we provide um, the, the rotifers as on a daily basis for food uh, with, and it's not a cheap product. It's quite expensive. It's, it's dry algae. Um, so just a second, I'm, oh. I've just sent a link. This is the product that we provide um, uh, to the rotifers, but because this is an expensive product, we mix it with yeast. So we have 30% of sparkle and 70% of yeast, and we mix it together and we provide them on a daily basis um, for food. And uh, have I have I answered the question right? I mean, is oh, okay. in, anything else in that? Yeah, uh, yeah. If Naresh, if 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 it if, we, if it is all right, um, I think you you can uh, come back if there's more questions. Um, but I think um, Sajine have another question. So, so how common yellow yellow tail kingfish in the commercial wild catch in Australia is is the wild caught fish is priced like the cultured ones. Uh, the one I got from Woolworth is. Forty dollars a kilo, or something. I think frozen, mm -hmm. but yeah. But that's again that's from Clean Seas. Uh, that will that be the product? Um, uh, the we don't have. Uh, we do have commercial uh, wild catches in in, but I think those are more supplied to fish markets, kind of a place like those big ones, and um, we do not find a lot. I don't. Uh, I don't think they are priced as the cultured ones because I think they must be selling a whole fish altogether as what I have seen personally. I haven't done, I'm sorry, I haven't done much research on the fact that um, uh, between the commercial aspect and uh, of marine catches of Australia um, as opposed to the cultured ones. Um, but I think I have a feeling they'll be, uh, they'll be costing more maybe than what we provide them. So why would anyone There's buy? A chance. Why would anyone buy a cultured one now? <laughs> uh, that's the problem. Nobody wants to buy a cultured one. But we are trying to tell them we are giving you something without parasites, and we are giving you something much healthier with having health checks on daily basis. Why wouldn't you want cultured? But well, people are like, no, we want it fresh. Yeah, this is fresh. There'll be different things. You know, wild wild ones are more natural. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is that is the. Yes, that is the thinking process, I believe. Yes, it is. Because my okay, friend used you, to Sushi. work. Oh, yes. Thank, thank you, Sushi. So uh, I, I have one more question. The brood stock yes. you are using, no? They are uh, yes. uh, through some selective breeding programs or normally they are yes. wild caught ones? No, so we, um, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. I remembered and then I forgot again. So we uh, follow the excellent. Um, I don't know if you all have um, heard in, it's a it's a UK based yeah. company I suppose it's X Select. So our brood stock at the current brood stock that we are using is our generation. So Clean Seas had read them and initially they were wild caught, but then after the wild caught they had their own generation, and now whatever brood stock available at Clean Seas is their own, uh, and um, we go through the X Select um, uh, program. So we all of our brood stock is tagged and their samples have been given to Excelect and they have like all of the data because we have some broodstock in our hatchery and then we have some broodstock in the cages as well. and every year we do a broodstock selection so what they do is um they uh, we will have a, a certain so before we harvest the fish and we send them to processing factory, they will look at their growth and they will chart out their growth and um, uh, their length and all of their health to see if that batch has been suffering from any diseases or did they get any kind of um, uh, deformities from that cage? Because every, every time we, whatever we, for example, we have taken uh, tank one, uh, brood stock and we put them in cage one so we will follow that cage one throughout because we know that the the 
the eggs have been provided by tank one. So we know that this is tank one's progeny. And then we will check their lineage and then their genetic family. They will trace it back to see if there has been any issues with them. And then they will scan again and then they will send the data to X Select and the X Select will run their uh, genetic program according to their softwares and everything. And they will give us a list of which broodstock we should select. And then we bring them back from the cages and we keep them in our uh, facility. And the ones that we currently have, either we discard them, unfortunately, or we keep them in our holding tanks for future, if in case, just to give them a, a break for that spawning period or for that spawning year. And then again, every after every harvest, um, they, they, they check again, they go through the same, um, the the, um, the traits they go for they look for growth they look for survival they look for disease resistance and whichever best they find they will give us a list that this is the tag number of your broodstock and you can use this for your next spawning season our first two first two runs are basically for good growth because they are have they happen in summer and then they get two summers and then that's like a best growth fish our third run is called our genetic run where we take various genetic uh, like um, different um, uh, species, like not species, different fish to see uh, their genetic variation and to see how they will perform two years from when they were put back into the sea. And this is one of the ways we can avoid inbreeding and um, uh, yes, and improve the traits on their growth and survival. I hope is, does yes, that make yes, sense? Uh, thank you. Uh, that you explained very well. I have one more question. Are you told yes. that the males mature at around one year and females mature at around four years, something? Yes. Told. So, is there any growth uh, difference in the according to sex or any any particular sex you prefer for culturing, or you just uh, uh, there is no selection of sex for um, culture? There is no selection. We prefer the females. We actually adore them. So we actually take care of them like. They are like the best things on this earth. We um, so we do have a more focus on the females because they do take longer time to mature, uh, and they are bigger than the males. That's how also now I'm not that experienced, but my manager is. So he always looks and be like, "Oh, I'm sure this is going to be a female," and they're all tagged, and they're all um, you know they've all seen it, and they so according to our tags also we have you know which one is male or female, but uh, females are the ones that we um, kind of um, take more care of and we try to keep them uh, as more happy as possible because losing a female can really cost us because it takes four years for us to get them to that level. Whereas males, it happens in a year. So we are not as keen on them as much. Also, um, I think one but sadly, we do get a lot of female mortalities as opposed to males in our tanks. Because during the spawning period and during why, when it's commencing towards the spawning period, um, the, you know, the temperatures are high and the males are super active and they tend to really get aggressive on the female. And that's when we have a lot of mortalities. So that is one of our crucial times when we tend to you know, do our best. But there's not much we can do. Um, in that sense, but females definitely, we tend to have more um, uh, kind of care and attention to them. Uh, sometimes we just leave, we have a quarantine tanks. So if we want to like keep them safe or we want them to have a relaxed time, we just put all the females into the quarantine tank until they we find a fit to introduce them back into the tanks. So yes, we do keep, keep them separately for a while until we need to introduce them again with the males. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that covered a little bit gap. <laughs> <laughs> That's not covered in the presentation. Good pick. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, just a good pick, you know, it was not in the presentation. So the, Yes, that... it was not. And I forgot to add it. It was my fault. I, and uh, it was a last minute ad that I had to say it, but it was a good pick. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if Anyone else have a question? You can please unmute and feel free to ask questions. Mm. 
Anyway, it's too late in Australia, so I think uh, <laughs> everyone is happy with what it is. Uh, so once again, thanks, uh, Sushti. Uh, so it will be one thirty, I guess, for you. Oh yes, it's exactly one thirty. Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I was very nervous, but um, it it just happened, so which is good. And thank you everyone uh, who is um, uh, complimented on, on the chat. I really appreciate the response. Um, and thank you Deepak for the opportunity.